With these uncertain times in global financial markets, as traders navigate the cross currents of a sell off in the long end of the bond market amid deteriorating geopolitical headlines, we see Brent crude and, and European natural gas as our beacons at the moment and our signals for financial markets. We're seeing equity markets consolidate and actually looking for direction, although traders are increasing their hedging flows through volatility and also through gold as well. Now, in the session ahead, we are watching for the big man, Mr. Jerome Powell. Will he step steady the ship or will he cause more uncertainty in these financial markets? It's time to get in front of the screens. This is the trade off. Well, hi there, my name is Chris Weston, Head of Research here at Pepperstone. I'm going to be joined in two seconds by Blake Murray from Forex Analytics. And we're going to be focused on all the topical fund, the thematics playing through in markets at the moment, the big ticket items which are causing sentiment to shift around on the dime, the uncertainty that seems to be brewing in financial markets. And we're going to try and dissect all of these factors and try and make sense of what's going on. Mr. Blake Murray, come into the programme and join me with me in a moment. How, how are you feeling and how are you going at the moment? Well, I'm I'm uh, I'm trying to make sense of everything going on too. You know, it's 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 like the, you know, they they use that term the fog of war. It really is uh, that way in the markets right now, isn't it, Chris? Well, it is. I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of factors at the moment where where you know we're just. I mean, you I know that you've 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 served um, before and obviously have much of a, 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 a an understanding of than I do. But I'm not a military strategist, and I'm looking at these headlines. But I am looking at factors that I that I that I do see as signals for higher volatility, European nat gas prices, Brent crude prices, for example, the sell-off that's happening in rates, the hedging flows that are taking place. And I'm letting the market do the talking for me. Um, obviously, yeah, watching headlines and we are in a, in a, in a more headline driven market, which means um, you know, you've got to be in front of your screens more often. It means the duration of your hold times comes into question. Your frequency of trading gets looked at because volatility is picked up. All of these factors mean that, you know, what, what does it mean, Blake? It means that our trading condition and our market environment is, is, is evolving before. And that obviously has huge implications for the level of risk we're taking on in a position, the position sizing, the duration of those positions I talk about there. So, you know, the, the, the trading environment by which we operate, you know, is evolving and, and morphing. And, and, you know, that that is really important for us, right? It really is. And uh, just just for clarity, you know, my my military uh, background is more from like a micro, uh, you know, standpoint, not not a big strategist standpoint, because I, I wasn't an officer of that scale. But I, I'll tell you this much, you know, when you're dealing with the markets, you really have to start thinking about those headlines that are coming across. But more importantly, what's the drivers behind the the, the underlying move that we're dealing with? And, and when you're dealing with currencies, the good news is you've got you, you got you know shows like this one right here on the trade-off where we can talk about some of the bigger themes that are driving the markets. Yes, you're going to have headlines pulling, you know, uh, currencies and, and asset classes certain directions. But if the underlying you know theme is is is, is staying intact, those trends should stay intact as well. So it's going to and it and it is. It's a quick moving market, Chris. It, is, it really right? is. We've got the VIX into 20%. It's causing me to, uh, to 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 not shave. I'm looking a bit dishevelled at the moment. You look good. Thanks, mate. I'll see you. I'll see you. Sex is the word you're looking for, isn't it? <laughs> that was, but I wasn't going to come. I wasn't going to come out of my mouth. No. Anyway, so. let's move into topical fun. Let's move on very, very quickly. All right. Let's go into those cross currents, Blake, because you know I think on one hand you've got this. I want to say relentless sell-off. Um, it has been, you know, every time everyone's saying, oh, you know, let's go and buy duration, let's go and buy the long end of the curve, tens and 30-year treasuries, for example, 10-year bunds. You know, we see sellers emerge and we see new highs. We're just seeing new highs in the 10-year treasury at the moment. We're, we're, we're eyeing a break into, or eyeing a move into 5%. five um, you know, we're seeing twos, tens curve steepening to, you know, to negative 30 basis points. You go into uh, interest rate markets and, you know, I look very closely at SOFA three month futures rates and we've got the, the least amount of, of rate cuts being priced in for 2024 that we've seen in this cycle. Um, yeah, cuts are still there, but they're certainly being continuously priced out this higher for long command. the market seems to have bought into it. Um, and yeah, like we're going to talk about power in the, in the next segment. But yeah, people have been seeing this this relentless sell off playing through higher real rates as well. Um, we've seen a number of Fed me uh, talking about this this tightening of financial conditions. The bond market is doing a lot of the heavy lifting for the central bank. There's no need to raise rates. 
yeah, when bond markets are, or, or real rates and nominals are moving up and, and it mitigates the need for them to, to, to raise the Fed funds rate. At the same time, you know, obviously, if you've got uh, geopolitical issues that, that, that we obviously all know um, and, and have been watching very, very closely indeed, and we're trying to price certainty, trying to price risk around that situation, it's very difficult to do so. Um, but those two cross currents alone, you know, are causing people to look at hedging flows, the VIX. You can see it in, 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 in S&P skew. You can see it in, obviously, the gold price. You know, in the FX market, the Swiss francs worked very well recently. Uh, so those are the cross currents by which we're working. At the same time, the bulls um, would say, you know, there's stuff out there to, to say that we could climb the wall of worry once we get some, some, some positive factors playing through. So how are you reading this right now? Well, I'm, I'm reading it the very same way as you. You know, the, the, the you have the gold market, you have the dollar. You know, it's it's interesting to see the dollar and gold pretty much rallying at the same time. Very right, very right. Uh, very right. Very yeah, right. And it's that's one of those other things that you go, oh my god, you got VIX at twenty, you got the dollar, you got gold, you got the Mexican peso selling off fairly aggressively and staying very well offered. Uh, you know, and 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 you know, stocks aren't really that far off of their most recent high. I mean, you, 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 they're holding on. But I think that's because you've got people, people are hedging, aren't they? You know, you go and buy downside puts, you buy, you've seen that in SKU. As I said, people are buying yeah. downside protection, buying gold, um, buying Swiss They're hedging those portfolios through that rather than necessarily just selling out of that core exposure. In fact, in the equity market, you know, they, they are rotating you know, out of tech to an extent, out of cyclical growth areas, into energy, um, into those more defensive areas. Of the, so there's not been a, a baby out with the bathwater, to use a horrible expression, um, but they've just been rotation within the sectors rather than just sell everything, right? They, they have. And, and, and going back to your original comment about yields, I mean, this, this bond market move has been absolutely relentless. I did have one of our one of our traders in inside our community was talking about uh, which I wasn't even look at the monthly tenure hitting 161 percent golden fib level and it's about ready to do it at five percent on a daily chart as well. So, you know, five percent is like that benchmark everybody talks about. You listen to you know any any financial news network they're going to talk about five percent, five percent, five percent on the tenure. It is going to be a barrier. I feel I think so. And as it's well. just like. Yeah, yeah. I think any barrier, you're gonna you're gonna get a reaction from there. We're so gonna have a look at the yeah, thirty. Think- when the thirty year touched five percent a couple of weeks ago, that was the moment we saw buyers step in. So I wouldn't be surprised. You know, things work very. It's like a mystical kind of mythical sort of pixies fairy situation. But when it hits that round number, it does that it does send sort of shimmers round. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if you know people start picking up some 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 ten year around that five percent level. Maybe we'll see what happens there. And, and just so you all know, I, I, we had a solar eclipse here where I lived this weekend. And so, you know, when that happens, you got to start buying some tenure. I'm just kidding. <laughs> joking, joking. But I just, just right, wanted to touch on before we go on to the next one. I just right. want an interesting thing. We're going to talk about um, commodities in a second. But that European natural gas, I think, is really important. Now, if we were to see European natural gas spike up, and we'll talk about that in a second, um, you will have a situation where people start talking about energy crisis number two in Europe. Now, I don't think that's going to happen, but it is a possibility and it's, it's a scenario that could happen. If we were to see European natural gas prices going on a big run, um, you will get the euro going down to parity in that situation. And that's the just going on your point and why I want to brought it up, because you talked about this idea of the dollar and gold rallying together. Now, if we were to see European natural gas prices spiking up, Brent prices spiking up, you are going to see euro dollar going down hard, European assets getting smacked. And you're going to see a stronger US dollar. The Dixie will rally concurrently with gold in a more extreme fashion. It's rare to see that, but that's exactly what you see. If Europe gets hit on this, um, then you are going to see the dollar and gold rally concurrently there. Yeah, and make sure you stick around for the setups because we that's on its way. So stick around. All right, let's let's move topics before you get beat over the head by our producer. Uh, let's go over to – let's talk a little Dan bit about – Dan him in his Powell. hard ways. <laughs> Pal, he no Pal speaking tomorrow. He's speaking at I want to say the New York Institute. Let me let me just New York clarify Economic Club. That. Economic Club. Excuse me. Thank you very much. I, I knew you would be all right on top of that. You know the thing is about um, you know the Fed. He he's coming in and he, the Fed Pal. He's going to be coming in tomorrow. He's going to be. It is late in the day for me. Just so you guys know, at the end of my day, it's not that late, words right? get jumbled up a little bit. Um, Fed Chair Pal. He's going to be speaking. He's going to be talking about monetary policy. But the question is, is he going to, is he going to, I want to say, save the market? Can he turn the tide? You know, you've had uh, how many, eight, eight different Fed chairs or Fed governors, regional Fed governors, uh, they say things like, 
Lori Logan, what'd she say the other day? Recent rise in long-term U.S. Treasury yields and tighter financial conditions more generally could mean less need for the Fed, Federal Reserve to exactly, raise interest yeah. rates yeah. further, right? That was that was Lori Logan's comments. But we've seen comments from the San Francisco Fed, very similar, but also many, many, many Fed governors, right? So everybody's kind of waiting to hear, are they going to get that from the horse's mouth from the Fed Chairman Powell? Because you talk about the wall of worry. We... We just had mentioned that stocks are they're 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 fragile, but they've been holding up fairly well. You know, we just had Netflix report it's up like nine, ten percent after hours. Even 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 Tesla missing earnings is still flat on the day, maybe up a little bit. You know, you, you got stocks that are holding up here, but I feel like it's like the fingers are on the ledge. And if Powell comes out tomorrow and he says, Yeah, you know, we don't the the market's doing a lot of the hard work for us in with with this rise in yields, maybe that's the green light for the stock market to get a little bit of a recovery rally. Flip side is him not confirming that. But oh, yeah. what are your thoughts, Chris, on what on what Powell's delivery is going to be tomorrow? Um, I mean, I think he'd be pretty pleased with the way that the yeah you know, the way that the the front end the two years behaving and the 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 interest rate pricing we're seeing in Fed funds future or swaps. You know they're. Um, I, yeah, the market's sort of giving themselves some optionality there, and I think he likes that. Um, but yeah, I think the, there's no doubt that the move in the long end, both on a nominal and real basis, is, is the is the equivalent of one, if not two, rate hikes from the Fed. Um, and you know, you've heard big members like Christopher Waller talking about it as well. Um, so I don't I don't think he's going to be overly as explicit as uh, as Laurie Logan or you know some of the other uh, like you know Christopher Waller, for example. Um, but certainly, I think he'd be, you know, given the idea that the the move in the in the rates market is is certainly there. And so, it, if anything, he's going to be pretty neutral. Um, and I don't think if anyone's going to think they're going to save it, it's going to come from from Jerome Powell, the horse, as you, as you, as you elegantly put it. Um, but at the same time, what's also going to be really important is this this idea about inflation. You know, we have seen um, you know a hotter CPI recently at 0.4 of a percent. The labour market continues to be very very hot. We saw with that with the, with the payrolls recently. Um, you know, there there are a number of data points which have got people quite quite concerns about yeah the, the the overall resilience if not reheating of the economy and so he will continue to bang this drum that, that they're not out of the woods yet and the fed are going to be remaining very very committed to bringing inflation down to target and he's going to he's not going to give anything away there so yeah again he's going to balance it out nicely by saying the inflation fight is clearly not done which it isn't and balance it out with the with the idea that you know that some of the market has, has mitigated the need to raise the fed funds rate so on balance it's difficult to know what everyone wants to know is where is the skew of risk for the dollar where is the skew of risk for gold and and, and the nasdaq and those kind of things i think it's pretty 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 neutral if anything um there's you know yeah i'm not sure where we've just quick one before we go where do you see the balance of risk i'm just seeing it both sides really I, I, I do I do think he's has to leave the door open because um, as we're going to well, for rate quickly hikes. talk about for rate hikes yeah, he yeah. has to leave that door it open has he has to he has to now it's not and if, if CPI was you know hovering around uh, New Zealand levels that we got last night might be a little different story but it's not well I think so, it's, it's an interesting one I think rates will be pricing in more rate hikes than they are they're not really pricing anything for november or you know and december the jaws of the joke but if it wasn't for the the geopolitical headlines we're seeing as well i think you know the the market would be saying we're probably going to get one in december so i think you're right so what you're, you're you're saying this there's modest dollar positive risks here i think there are oh, so see. let's move on to commodities um and I, I do think this is the big issue. And I talked about the idea about what's happening in geopolitics. And uh, obviously, in my, my opinion on this whole situation carries no weight and it's no different from anyone else's. But what I, what I am looking for is, is, is trying to understand the signals from the market that, that could show us that we could be moving into a higher volatility regime. Obviously, there's algorithms who can interpret news better than us and react faster than us. Um, but for me specifically as a market participant, when I'm looking at FX positions, rates positions, bond uh, equity positions, um, the, the, the signals I'm looking for, Blake, is, is around supply constraints that come from 
um, Leviathan uh, gas field up in the north of Israel. I think that's one that's been very much touted. We saw a gas field being taken offline in, in Israel last week, obviously for security concerns. But the, the Leviathan one, or a lot of that gas has been rerouted up. That, that, that lies up in the north of Israel. It's some way away from Gaza. Um, Israel wanted to you know, make sure that, that there's no issues with that at all. But if there was concerns coming through that other regional players were going to be more involved, um, and certainly Iran is, is a big one there, um, then, then people would ramp up the probabilities that we're going to see supply issues coming through Leviathan. Um, and that supplies you know, a significant amount of LNG or, or gas coming out of there. So if that happens, we would see a spike up in European nat gas. Of course, the big one um, is around the Straits of Hormuz. If people thought that, 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 that there was going to be supply issues or disruptions and that, that you know, that, that sees cargo, LNG cargoes coming, uh, being disrupted through there. You know, Qatar, which are 20 percent of the LNG market, are big users of that straight. Um, and again, that's going to see European natural gas prices spike up, as we saw in March of 2022 and August of 2022 last year. When European natural gas price goes, it can be incredibly aggressive. If Brent prices move up, you know, yeah, close towards 100 bucks because of because supply concerns. Yeah, these are things that are going to see euro dollar coming under pressure, euro assets under pressure big time, and people are going to be concerned about the cost of living crisis there, throwing the European erosion as well as other countries into a greater um, you know, stagflation, recession type environment. So that's what I'm watching. I'm hoping it's obviously not going to happen, um, but the triggers are there and, and you know, price action will tell you everything you need to know. So that's the markets I'm looking at specifically around this. Obviously, if we think it's going to keep contained, maybe you see sellers playing through. But these are the markets, Blake, that I'm really, really going to be focused on there. What, do you, what are you looking at? <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm for you and and for what you're focused on. It's like I, I think you have covered the topic pretty well. But I, I, I want to ask this question to you specifically: Where does Russia and what role do they play in this whole situation? I think you're sort of getting out of my pay, pay grade. I'm sure there, you know, there's there's plenty of people out there who, who, uh, who, who have strong opinions on on that. And yeah, I, I'm not. Yeah, I think my my opinion counts for nothing. So. But, but but for me, Blake, what's what's more what's more important is it's just price action. The market and the market tells you um, that they that they see the geopolitical issues causing a supply issue, and yeah, maybe Russia's further down in in, in that situation. Um, but yeah, I think the market tells you then that you can increase the probability of something else happening in in another market, right? So that's the way I'm looking at it. Yeah, it sure does feel. I you know I could go on a rant, and I'm not going to because. Again, we have to move along, but it's like you, you, you think about where all the big players are falling uh, towards and what sides they're falling towards in situations like this. And it, it really gets you uh, thinking about things in a much different way. Anyway, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and move along and let's talk a little bit about the dollar, Chris. Uh, the dollar obviously plays a key role in all this. And what we've noticed over the last um, you know, couple of weeks is a, a, a really quiet FX market. Really, you know, and all and all for all intents and purposes, the dollar has been just kind of st uh, steady, um, you know, holding its breakout point. And I think that that's the one thing that we have to our big takeaway is we've had a massive rally this year and we're not giving any of that back, at least not yet. And 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 we'll see. Maybe Powell might have something to say about that tomorrow. Uh, maybe he maybe he he's he's the one that sticks the uh, the, the wooden stake in the dollar's heart. But I wouldn't bet on that necessarily. And, you know, if he keeps the door open, um, you know, you have to ask, is the dollar too overbought to be bought? Because, you know, that's where I look at the dollar right now. I'm like, is it too overbought to be bought? Maybe. But it's also too strong to be sold. So that's why I think most most traders and most, uh, you know, most people are now starting to look at the dollar and saying, can we have continued legs from here, especially if yields continue to go higher? or if geopolitical concerns tend to, those tensions start to rise even more so than they are now. I mean, we we are literally just a few headlines from the dollar hitting new highs on the year. Um, so how are you looking at the dollar at this point, Chris? Because I see it as a very, technically, very strong run that is now, it's like a, it's like a fast runner, the Usain Bolt of, uh, of, of the FX market, who just you know sprinted and is now catching his breath again, and and that's the way the dollar feels like to me. Yeah, how are you seeing it? Well, you're interested. You make a good point about the volatility. Yeah, you know, gold vols have gone up to fifteen percent in in one week implied vol. Um, yeah, you know, the VIX has pushed up to twenty percent. But actually, FX vol, if you look at you know, various readings, is still 
really hasn't really moved. People are not expecting mass yeah. increased vol uh, volatility. One thing that, that gets me is, is there was headlines about the Bank of Japan upgrading its inflation forecast at the next meeting on the 31st of October to 3% for this year and 2% for next year. Now, that could have implications. That sort of just uh, talks us about this, this idea about the Bank of Japan looking to tweak policy. If that happens, then we will see high volatility for FF, FX markets. But for now... Yeah, look, I mean, it's interesting. You know, you have seen, I think on Friday when we saw the big risk aversion playing through, big moves up, that free sigma moving gold, um, you know, people were obviously de-risking going into the weekend. And, and, and in the session we've just seen there, you know, you've seen classic risk aversion, not to the same extent as Friday. But in both times, Blake, um, the Swiss franc has raised its hand and, and was being the best performing currency. So it feels like in this kind of, when you, when you, when you see headlines and the market de-risks and equities, vols go higher, the Swiss the Swiss franc has been the best performing currency. You know, I think that continues. Um, and, you know, if you are looking for a currency, if you, if you are of, of the view that, that these headlines get worse and, you know, equity markets draw down, VIX trades into 25%, I think the Swiss franc has told you right now that, that this is the, probably the, the number one safe haven currency. And so I think that's interesting. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, volatility hasn't necessarily changed. The dollar... It sort of, I think we, we talked about it last week, bearing into a, yeah, the, the US dollar is going into a choppy period. I think that's kind of what we're seeing. But for me, the Swiss franc looks really interesting. The market's shown you this is their flavor to hedge in the FX market. And just so you know, we, we talked about the Swiss franc last week, thanks to Eduardo. And actually, I think we hit it twice on two different pairs last week, here, right here at the trade off. But I, I want to say that I just just before we move move on, I have to say this, you know, studying a lot of markets uh, over the you know years, we've you and I have both been through periods of risk aversion. Uh, one of the key characteristics that you'll notice during a, a market that gets risk averse is you will see, and going back to the old running uh, analogy I was using about Usain Bolt, risk aversion shows up, and when you see it, it, it tends to be like a relay race. You'll see the dollar take take the baton. Then you'll see the Swifts take the baton. Then you'll see the yen take the baton. Then gold. Then bonds. It's it's crazy to watch because not everything's moving up, you know, all at the same time. But you'll get like a relay race of different currencies. They'll take the baton in different legs of the move. Something just to keep in mind as we as we move forward, just in case things do uh, get worse. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Good call. Cool. All right, let's go into that's a setup uh, and have a look at some of the charts uh, that we've got front of mind. <laughs> Yeah, first one I want to bring is gold. It's a more extension of what we saw last week. I brought up gold and it's continuing to work very well as a, a hedge in this kind of safe haven situation. But also, you know, we've, um, you know, the, the idea that the Fed are probably going to be uh, done tightening um, because the bond market is doing a lot of the heavy lifting is, is, is also possibly helping. Although I think, you know, the, the moves at the long end of the curve, both in nominal and real rates, is, is, is you know, subtracting the investment case. But I think right now the market's shown you that they, they are using gold as a preeminent hedge against the geopolitical uh, headlines that we're seeing. Um, and I think, for, for, which is why you're seeing gold rally in all currencies, you know, regardless of whether it's the Swiss franc, you know, the, the US dollar, Aussie dollar, whatever, gold's rallying in all currencies. So it, it is an out and out safe haven play. But we've, we've broken that channel, Blake, um, which is obviously bullish. And we've, we've come back to test that. And we found buyers stepping off there. We're just just finding a few sellers, a bit of supply coming into those September highs. But if we get a clean break of that, then 1980, 81, um, that red sort of sort of line, the rectangle box that I've drawn, um, has been the supply area for the gold market about eight or nine times over the last 12 months. So, yeah, that, that that's where you'd be looking for the scalpers out there. So, um, yeah, how are you seeing this technically at the moment? I, I, I'm i going to say this just, uh, and I'd hate to sound this way, but I'm going to look at it exactly the way you are. Look, gold is in a precarious situation where it could really substantially rally, um, you know, I think. So buying dips makes sense to me. I, I hate chasing things after 10% move, 9% move, whatever we've seen here in the gold market over the course of the last couple of weeks. Uh, that I, I don't like buying into strength like that. I like to buy on dips. The question is, are we going to see a dip? You know, you have to look at situations like tomorrow. Like let's say the you know Powell, Powell does say something where the dollar gets a nice little kicker, and uh, and 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 you do see some weakness or maybe some of the data that comes out later this week. That produces a little bit of a, a dollar strength gold weakness because you'll see the instant response like that but you have to be there and ready to buy dips so i think that gold is 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 one of those 
in one of those weird situations, I say weird situations where you had a very impulsive move. So now you need to be buying dips and they're probably shallow dips at that. Well, that's right. Because I mean, on one hand, you got the, the we talk about these double cross currents, that these cross currents that the, the, the markets and, and gold's obviously facing. But yeah, I agree. I think if we get a if we get a pullback, it becomes a buying opportunity um, because then the market just refocuses on on the headlines that are coming out from the Middle East. And and if we were to see a deterioration, that that dip will be bought, and 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 you'll see higher highs on the back of that. So, on one hand, we've got our eyes on power. I still think the Middle East situation is the dominant driver of gold. If we were to see a lot of the sort of regional countries that have been talked around being contained, um, then then I think gold markets got downside because. Um, you know, I think that, that that's where, where people are more concerned about that it becomes something a little bit bigger. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, if Powell causes a, a dip on the, on the back of this, you know, we buy, I'm, a, I'm a buyer of that. And then we focus, refocus back on headlines around the jib, uh, around the Middle East, I think is the situation there. hundred percent. All right. Um, you know, speaking of Nat Gas, uh, let's uh, take it to uh, uh, my first setup, which is going to be Nat Gas. And I hate for I hate for my immaturity to show here, but it is late in the day for me. And on your look, kids, I, on my, your kids, like teenagers. <laughs> my my kids are sixteen and nineteen, and I've <laughs> I've had them I had them pulling my finger up until about the age of twelve. So that's pretty good. So uh, you know, hopefully you you parents have done that as well. Yeah, yeah moving up. I produce my own natural gas over here uh, right. on this side of the anyway. All right, so look at this setup, Chris, and check out this chart. I mean. Nat gas, it is it is is backed itself up right to the breakout point. And I mean, this is basically three bucks. Three bucks seems like a magnet. It's 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 do or die here. You've 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 mapped out the reasons why you know European natural gas could go higher, but guess what? US natural gas would probably move up in in this in a similar fashion, not quite as aggressive, but still it would it would move higher in that situation. So I think you have to keep an eye on this from a setup perspective. Like if you are, you know, bearish your outlook of the Middle East, you think things are going to get worse, you think you know European energy costs are just they're bound to go higher. This could be a good play for you just from a risk reward perspective because you can see it's been see so it's hard. At. It's been so hard. You know, you bought the, bought the breakout. You just hope that it. I mean, obviously, when you when you buy breakouts, you just you don't know when they're going to go. So many of them fail, but you're just hoping for that. You know that 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 kicker that just continues running, and you, and it and it can do with that gas. The thing is, it's come back, and it may, it may well be a false breakout, and it's frustrating. Um, you know, I think with with this situation, yeah, look, you you may get some sympathy from the, the moves that you get in EU net gas, um, but I think as well you've got to become a weather a weatherman in 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 the US and look at you know weather patterns in the Northwest and Midwest and you know see the temperatures and obviously if you were to get below you know average temperatures to this time of the year and as we go into the you know the North American winter, um, you know people will be predicting that and that's where you're going to see the, the you know the, the 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 price move as well. So taking a little bit of sympathy from moves in EU natural gas, but yeah. You've got to get those weather stations on, Blake, and uh, and look at the uh, the cold climates and and see how that sort of how's it's faring. If we were to see a yeah a downturn in in, in the weather patterns and in looking a bit colder and a bit blistery, then then yeah, one suspects that the 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 nat gas price goes up because yeah, look, storage is pretty good, and certainly in European natural gas, I mean inventory levels are at ninety six percent or so. So um, yeah, from that perspective, I think you've got to become a weatherman as well. Well, there you go. There you go. Um, anyway, let's go into the US 500. We can't touch it. I, sort of, I know we, we over-index on the FX side of things here, but uh, we can't forget the uh, the, the equity um, brothers and sisters out there who who you know obviously have a big way. But I talked about this in, in the synopsis earlier that, that we've got this slight consolidation playing for in, in, in stocks. You know, Netflix, obviously, um, on, on, the, on the NASDAQ side of things, coming out with some, with, with some amazing price action after hours and, and you know we expect volatility from that stock but uh, yeah the streaming numbers in q3 have obviously pleased the market but we're seeing that consolidation um and actually I sh if you go and have a look at nasdaq you've got this really nice uptrend and, and and sort of horizontal support levels coming through that trend's still very much in place but you know for me blake that 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 red horizontal support level i think is, is going to be key do we go back to test it well we tested it recently we got good bids off that level we got buyers off the 200 day moving average uh, and now we're consolidating so you know, it's kind of which way does it go, one or the other? Um, and I think once the market reveals itself, you yeah, know, that could be quite powerful. Um, you know, I think if we get a, a break of that, that red resistance or support level, I think that, that would be a very powerful level and see the VIX coming up to 25%. But if we get a break out to the top side, I want to trade that from the long side as well, because I know the market is very well hedged at the moment through optionality, through volatility, and through 
you know, being long gold as well. So, you know, if those hedges will need to be unwound. We've got options expire this Friday. So which way does this go, in your opinion? I, well, based on based on where we're at right now and everything that's that's happening, my assumption is that we break 4,300 and, and we go lower and revisit the 200-day moving average. However, again, going back to Powell, Maybe Powell, uh, you know, uh, throws the throws throws the dog a bone and and uh, and throws the market a bone, and perhaps we get some a topside move. I would say that a move above forty four hundred would be bullish. It would squeeze the crap. Is that out the pain trade? Is that the pain trade? That's where- the pain trade. It's yeah. the wall of worry. It's the pain trade. So you know, as I said earlier, the equity markets are holding up pretty good despite everything that's happening. So with that being said. I have like a little sandbox, Chris. It's 4,300 to 4,400. And now 4,300 was tested today within just a couple of points. And so we are just, that's, we're around the edges right now. So just keep an eye on it. Yeah, I think you've got, you've got some levels to work with. And I think the market is, as I say, very well, very well hedged. So, you know, if it reveals itself, I think we're going to, I think you're going to see headlines in, you know, Bloomberg's and all those kind of things of, the wall of worry it's going to be something that, that people do so yeah i mean obviously we need we need reasons to rally and use it it's because the market's yeah you know, been yeah price pessimistic and and we see you know less signs or more certain times ahead and i think that that's you know something but yeah that that, that red box that i've got there i think is, is something that's really really important there i think you know the market if it- that's yeah that's the sandbox and i can see it now chris michael burry squeezed out of all short positions right <laughs> you see that right now right yeah. all right uh i'll take it to our last our last topic or our last setup excuse me and this is the pound aussie um you know you'll notice that uh and i had to ask that you guys do use head and shoulder shampoo over there in australia so that's that's a good thing so with you guys old spice, get mate. I've, got, I've, I've got mine with old spice now so I, not only do uh do i I'm, I'm free of a, a dandruff life, but also my hair smells absolutely amazing. Woo, that's amazing. You know, it's funny. My I put so much product in my hair on the top side that it never even makes it to my scalp. So my scalp is always great. I don't even need this stuff. <laughs> anyway, uh, but, you know, this chart is it's been a setup on my radar for the last couple of weeks, actually. And I was, uh, you know, you when you see these setups, you're like, how in the hell is that going to form? Like, what is going to be? The catalyst that's the driver well first of all i'll just say as long as the price stays below the 50 dma and 194 and that 194 30 something is the 50 percent retracement but just just th- think about the 50 dma as long as we stay below the 50 dma we have this setup of a possible head and shoulder pattern we saw some good data out of china yesterday uh better than expected i guess you could say as you pointed out last week you're more constructive on australian dollar next week we have uh, flash PMIs out of the UK. We also have inflation data out of Australia. If that surprises based on what we just saw out of New Zealand and we get a, a decent, well, decent, a relatively hot number out of Australia, maybe that's the catalyst. That's just a setup. And I think while below 194, you look lower for uh, for resumption down. But above not 194, I think you got to start looking at it as being invalidated. So, what do you think, Chris? I like this lower. I like this lower. Actually, I really like this lower. And um, yeah, I I mean, buying the Australian dollar never feels right. It feels horrible to do so. You you do it, and you sort of go go into a quiet room and beat yourself. But um, you know, like China's looking a little bit better. I think we've seen the lows in 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 the data. I know there's still really big concerns around the property space, which needs absolute yeah monitoring. but I think we, we, I think we've turned a corner. There's, there's a huge amount of liquidity going into markets. We just need the equity market to rally a bit more. That CPI number is going to be a big one. Now the RBA have opened the door to rate hikes. We saw that in the RBA minutes. There's no doubt that they are no. their tolerance for inflation um, is, is 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 reduced. They're concerned about the housing market. We've seen seven months of, of property price gains there. Um, yeah, they, they talked about unit labour costs at a time of lower productivity. Um, being inflationary. Um, and if we were to get a, a CPI print next week, the market's probably going to be looking for something around 5.2%, which is in line with the monthly numbers. 5.4% would see, in my opinion, them revise up their inflation um, estimates, which are way too low at the moment. I think they're calling for the, the year-end inflation around 4.5%. So this number would, would see them revise that number up. And, and I think that would open the door for rate hikes um, probably not November, but certainly in the December meeting, the market would there. And but it would make the, the November seventh meeting in, in Australia a live meeting, um, and and I think the Aussie is going to go up. So a combination of slightly better data in 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 China, uh, a hot CPI number potentially next week, 
Um, and and you're going to see Sterling Aussie going downtown to Chinatown. So I think um, you know, I think that's where you're going to be. So I like I like it lower, um, but I want yeah I'd like price to. And it's obviously a lot of ifs. We need this to happen. We need this to happen, which of course is really difficult to do in in, in uh, you know as a sort of trader. Um, but that, that that is a scenario that could feasibly happen, and that's what takes uh, Sterling Aussie down. So yeah, I like it lower. Awesome. If the, the, if this, then that type of market, Chris. But yeah, I, I heard someone say to me the other day that the RBA are going to raise rates because petrol prices have... I think that's the most ridiculous notion that a central bank's going to be raising rates because of fuel prices. It's just, I mean, I'm not having to go at the question themselves, but the idea that a central bank... I mean, it's completely counterintuitive. Petrol... Pro, yeah, in Australia, if, people, if, if rates are going up, people are not going to drive less. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. I mean, well, people might drive less, but it's not going to do anything to the petrol price. You know, I mean, even if people drive less, the demand's not going to necessarily impact because that's going to be driven by 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 what's happening in, in the overall oil markets and, and, and tapis oil. So I just think it's just going to end up hurting the consumer. All it's going to end up doing by raising rates in a rising petrol environment is cause, you know, a big tax on the consumer. It's going to you know, take us one closer, to, a step closer to the recession. Yeah, look, raise rates because of what's happening in, in, in underlying inflation in from other areas and certain rents and other you know, housing market. But yeah, look, the idea of raising rates because of petrol prices is is mental to me. Absolutely crazy. Hey, hey, hey R- RBA, if you're uh, if you're you happen to be listening in right now, uh, his name is Chris Weston. He's at Pepperstone. You can get a hold of him there. What's your address there, Chris? I'm just kidding. Yeah. Move along. Yeah. yeah. I won't, I won't tell you because my, my producer will be around my house for dinner or something, so I won't say the, the, the email address very quickly. Anyway, let's move, let's move on to Player of the Day. Well, I'm going to have a look at Kiwi Swiss. Um, as I said, uh, the, the, right now the market has told us a couple of times, I know it's not a great sample, but I think those samples are very significant. Um, that the Swiss franc is 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 is, is obviously a, a currency that, that everyone wants in times of risk aversion. Um, look, do I do I do I think that there's going to be more headlines that that causes risk aversion? Yes, obviously I hope that's not going to be the case. But um, look at look at the trend that we've been seeing. This is just one fraction of the trend. Take this chart out to to, to a multi-year chart. You can see this just beautiful downtrend that's been in place. So we're trading within within a beautiful trend. We've done a regression here of that channel. Um, they've broken the, rock, the, the short term uptrend. So it's just staying there. The rate of change is still positive uh, to the downside. Um, yeah, the Swiss franc. Yeah, look, the Swiss, the Swiss National Bank are probably done on, on raising rates, but certainly the Kiwis are as well, and you know they're they're, they're going to see more fragility to you playing through. So I like this technically. It's do, it's going down. I like selling rallies in this. I think this this time next week this pair will be lower, um, and you're just trading on just a lovely longer term downtrend that's been in place. Um, so if we were to see yeah more headlines playing through, uh, risk aversion, gold prices going up, yeah yeah treasuries going up, whatever. Then, then I think the Swiss franc will be the place to be, and um, you know I think uh, Kiwi Swiss will be will be the play uh, you know that I want to be leveraged to there. All right, well um, that that's great, and I, again I'm going to do a little hat tip to Eduardo last week for bringing the Aussie Swiss as our viewer question last week. Hat Swiss because I actually traded. Yeah, I, I traded that one to the short side, uh, and I'm still short actually. I've been kind of. Uh, trading that one, you should have picked the New Zealand Swiss, Eduardo. What's what's up? No, just oh, kidding. They, both, right, they both, uh, both did well. Both did well. They did. They did. Let's uh, move along. My play of the day is the U.S. dollar Norwegian krona. The no way Norway. Uh, and uh, look, one one of the one of the things about and I don't have a position in the U.S. dollar Norwegian krona, but I know a lot of people have been ch- just trying to fade this one, thinking that oh, you know, this rally in crude. Is going to 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 uh, give the it's going to be a tailwind for the for Norwegian krona. Uh, you know, it's not going to rally much. Uh, the U.S. dollar Norwegian krona can't rally much because of this what's happening in the Middle East. But look, uh, you know, you, this thing is trying to break out. It's trying to stage a breakout, and I think it it challenges the eleven thirty level on a breakout. And you got to just imagine there's a lot of momentum there. The l- nice long term channel that could take us into new trend highs. So if the dollar catches a bid following Powell tomorrow, this is going to be on my front burner tomorrow is the U.S. dollar Norwegian krona for a breakout on the long side. And um, that would be my play of the day, Chris. And there it looks like it's Well, it looks like it's going in the right direction. So, yeah, I mean, that that does feel like it's, um, you know, that that, that it's got momentum for the side rates change going up. So I think you're, you're trading on the right side of the ship there. So certainly an interesting one. 
uh, to look at there. Anyway, that's all we've got time for on the trade-off. Thanks for watching. If, you wanna, if you've stayed on this long, uh, smack the like button. Leave us a comment about how you're trading the financial markets. We'd love, love, love to see those. Let us leave us any kind of setups you want us to look at or anything that you've been you know, looking at yourself. And we'll see you back next week for more of the trade-off.